Good morning. Thank you for joining us at the World Innovation Summit for Education. My name is Jeff Salingo, and I'm author of College Unbound and the forthcoming book, There is Life After College, which will be released in April. The book explores the topic that is at the heart of what we're going to discuss today, how students launch into careers, and how higher education is preparing, or not preparing, students to take on the jobs of tomorrow in an increasingly perilous economy. This discussion on the development of human capital, of course, comes at a time, a very critical time, in the history of our world. Today, almost a quarter of the planet's youth are neither working nor studying. Indeed, the economic crisis of 2008 has taken a particular toll on the world's youth, young people. And this comes even as much of the world struggles to catch up in terms of the development of their own higher education systems. And century-old institutions around the world are challenged on many fronts, from demographic shifts to technological advances and, of course, international competition. Today, we have a superb group of individuals who are focused on these exact questions that we're going to address. They have devoted their research and work over the last couple of years to creating better futures for both graduates and employers that will hire them. And I think you will enjoy today's engaging conversation and we'll be taking questions at the end of today's panel as well. We're gonna focus today's conversation in, in three areas. One, talking about the skills gap and, the, and or the lack of jobs um, and how do we boost demand for college educated workers. Uh, we're then going to be looking at what students need and what universities are not providing. Uh, for the future of, uh, of the workforce. And then finally, I think probably the most critical question is who pays for all of this? Um, students, employers, universities, states, or a combination uh, thereof. Um, let me first begin with, um, with Hugh. Hugh, there's obviously a, a relationship between education and employment. There always has been. Um, and there's high expectations of, of candidates fresh out of, of higher education, and of course they're meeting the reality of the, uh, of the job market. Your claim is that the real crisis is in demand um, uh, for workers. Um, and, uh, and can you talk a little bit about the idea that maybe there's not a skills gap, but really there's an opportunity gap here? Jeff, thanks for that. Um, yeah, when you look at much of the discussion and the debate um, about the role of education um, in relation to the economy, it's framed in terms of um, a theory of human capital, which assumes that if you have enough educated labor, that will increase the productivity of the economy, and that employers will recognize that. And having recognized it, will employ this well-educated workforce. When we look at the data, that is not the case. And it was not the case before 2008, and it's been made worse after 2008. And so it is not a question of a competition for skills, either nationally or indeed in terms of individual individuals. Rather, it is a competition for the jobs that are now available. And what we're seeing is not an expansion of those jobs at the high end, they're either stagnating at the moment or in fact in some countries declining. What we're seeing much more is an increase in the numbers of low wage jobs. When you look at graduate futures in the developed world, so the world that Michelle Obama was talking about this morning in terms of the United States, what you see there is that around 50% of graduates are doing non-graduate or sub-graduate work. Uh, the same is precisely the case in the United Kingdom. And when you actually take apart the data on the premium to education, what you see is that there are different earners within that overall profile of graduate earners. Those in the top 10% earn very high salaries and they increase over time. Those who are on the median um, income tend to uh, have a small increase till the age of 30 and then they flatline for the rest of their time. And then everything then goes below that as well. 
And then in terms of the discussion this morning, which I thought was brilliant, um, for women, um, their earnings are still significantly less than they are for men. This is in the United States, it's also the United Kingdom. When you come to the developing world, those issues that I've just raised are compounded. Jeff, I'll leave it at that. Okay. So Monica, in Latin America, you're obviously very focused on, on helping employers find workers. You think there is a skills gap. Um, how can we better align higher education with the needs of the economy, not only with jobs that exist, but skills that may outlast the jobs of tomorrow? Because obviously jobs are, are ever changing and skills are just as important as training people for jobs. How can we better align these, these two systems from what you're seeing? Well, first of all, yes, I do believe that we have a non-balance between talent and the uh, demand of talent. Uh, in my power group, we do a survey each year. In 2014, 36 of the employers that we uh, surveyed said that they had difficult to find the right people, the right talent at the right place, at the right cost. But uh, in this year, this number raised to 38%, with countries that are facing really a lot of challenges to find the right candidates. For example, in Japan, 83% of the employers said that they had problems. In Peru, 68. In Hong Kong, 65. The, the country that said that has less difficult to find people is in 14%. So there is a... There's, there are numbers, there is a fact that we have this mismatch. Because to be a graduate is important, but more important is to have the soft skills that companies need now. Because we are facing a very competitive market in which companies need to adapt very quickly, to change the business models very quickly, and to develop and execute the business strategy. So is the problem that they can, there's, there's plenty of people, they just don't have the right skills? Yes, we have many people looking for a job. We have unemployment in many countries, but uh, if we can change the slide for the next one, we have many people with very basic skills and few people with sophisticated skills. Mm -hmm. But the demand of talent is uh, on the contrary. We need few people with basic skills and more people with more sophisticated skills so that this mismatch creates a tension. Here you can see the 10 um, the more difficult positions to fill. For four years in a row, skilled trade workers has been the most difficult position to fill in the world. So we need to create this kind of um, dialogue between the market, the labor market, and the universities and, and schools so we can develop talent that make uh, everyone wins in the world of work. Well, what are you seeing here in Qatar in terms of the issues that both you and Monica were uh, addressing just now in terms of this mismatch between what the economy needs and what uh, higher education is producing? Um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting to uh, hear my colleagues and, and discover that we have a kind of um, a reverse uh, um, effect here in Qatar because we are graduating overqualified <laughs> graduates in Qatar whereas, and we are in a developing country with an underdeveloped market. So in terms of... An underdeveloped uh, uh, job market. Uh, yeah, job market, exactly. So uh, we don't have enough jobs. We need to... Uh, our job as high and higher education and especially in new colleges, uh, for example, and new universities like HBKU is to create career paths to create careers for our graduates by engaging with the market, whether governmental or private sector. Uh, there are many aspects, of course, that we can talk about, but most of our services in Qatar are outsourced. Uh, so there are no uh, career paths for our graduates. Um, as I said, they're overqualified. And when we speak about women in specific, there is always, if you, we're a part of the MENA paradox, where the number of women graduate does not correspond to um, uh, the number of uh, women in, in the career, um, uh, working actually, and participating in their national uh, economies. Uh, unfortunately, because in the Arab world or in the MENA region, there are two dichotomous pictures. There is the prosperous countries like Qatar, for example, where women sometimes don't need to work or they don't have 
enough security, job security, to venture into the market. Uh, given that there are no um, um, laws and regulations that protect women and, you know, the glass ceiling and all that. And there are the less prosperous countries, of course. Monica, you mentioned earlier the soft skills, how important those are. But universities are not great at teaching them because they're hard to measure, right? So how do we teach, in your mind, how should we teach those soft skills? How should higher education well, teach I those think soft skills? Well, that, that we should start developing the, those skills since uh, the elementary school. University is probably too late to develop all the skills that we need in the competitive global markets that we are facing. Uh, skills like leadership, uh, team working, problem solving, things like understand a, a text, to write correctly, to, to be able to collaborate in a virtual world. These so-called 21st century skills. The, uh, these are right. the, the, the skills that need to be developed. Uh, there are not only academic knowledge, it's also to develop the individual in a moralistic way. But Jamil, let me bring you into the conversation here. It used to be that a, a university education was seen as a broad education, providing many of these, these skills, and then employers would train workers for the specific job. Now employers expect universities in the education system to do that job for them. So they want candidates, job candidates, who have both the soft skills as well as the hard skills to do the job on, on day one. I guess the question is, whose responsibility is it to prepare people for the workforce? You know, employers say it's higher education's job. Higher education says, well, it's part of our job, but it's not all of our job. Employers have to have a, a say in this as well. They have to have a role in this as well. Whose job is it to prepare the workforce, the talent workforce of tomorrow? I think it's both of them have to work together. And when you look at successful examples, it's when universities reach out to employers to find out what are the needed skills, and employers commit themselves and get involved in, in working with the universities. I think a great example is, the, is Waterloo University in, uh, in Ontario, in Canada, where they have a so-called co-op program where from day one it's structured so that students will spend some time at school and then go and work with companies and then come back. And we have a, a really close relationship with employers helping shape the curriculum, participating even through their practitioners in the, in the teaching, and the students getting real uh, an experiential uh, learning uh, curve and, and it's not only for engineering uh, but they have really reached a point where they're able to engage and do it for all the, the programs. Right, but even in the survey that was taken for this, uh, for this conference, um, you know, 52% said project-based learning is one of the biggest challenges for post-secondary schools or universities, right? So the, the work that Waterloo and other universities are doing to actually help students apply what they're learning in the classroom, why is that so difficult? Why do so few universities really incorporate that? Not just incorporate it, but really infuse it into the curriculum. I think it was uh, Harvard's former president who said that it's easier to move a cemetery than to change a curriculum <laughs> because at least in the first case we get the collaboration of the party of the inhabitants. <laughs> uh, and I think also the point that Monica made that he has to start very early. If throughout you know, primary education and secondary education, students just sit in a passive way, listening to what the professor is telling them, professor has all the knowledge and you're not supposed to contradict or question, and then all of a sudden you get to a university where you are asked to work on projects, uh, solving problems, designing new solutions, they may not be prepared. So it has to start very early to develop these critical thinking skills and to, I think, you know, to, to use the words that uh, Michelle Obama used this morning of empowering the, the students. Well, what are you seeing here in Qatar in terms of as you're developing your higher education system, you know, as we're seeing in other parts of the world, when higher education systems are developed, they tend to go right for the workforce development and kind of skip over the broad education. How do you balance the needs of both the workforce but also broadly educating uh, the population? Because that's, that's a tension in many parts of the world between those two 
dual needs of, of universities. True, and following up on, on what my colleague said actually is, um, I think it's easier, it's harder to maneuver within the rigid structures of old universities. And it's easier to do so uh, within uh, the fluid universities in developing countries like Qatar, for example. So I think universities here are doing well, especially, and, and I, again, my, my expertise lay, lies in an education city, is um, that they respond to the market need. Mm -hmm. But moreover, they reshape it. So they think ahead, and this is what we do through, through research and technology. Um, and and I, I'm happy to say that we don't only respond to change, we actually affect change in that matter. So Monica, is there a point where employers will just say, we don't need higher education, we can, we can do this better ourselves? I mean, do you see employers kind of taking over some of the training mechanism if they don't get what they get a need out of colleges and universities? What, what I see is that everyday certifications, titles, and uh, PhDs are less important than, than uh, soft skills. Mm -hmm. So we look for individuals that can adapt, learn every day, because having a, uh, a certification is not enough, having a title is not enough. We need to look for individuals that are willing to learn and willing to unlearn, because uh, we need to move faster in organizations. So if you have two candidates, for example, one with two or three PhDs, but without the soft skills, you prefer the other one because that will help you to innovate, to move, and to compete in uh, different markets. Jamil, the, the scale of the problem we're talking about here is, is big, right? It's not only the scale within individual countries, but across the, the world, and, and, and technology has increasingly played a role in recent years in, in helping educate more people. Uh, but yet we see even from the, the survey that was done for, um, for WISE this year that you know, only 29% believe online learning is just as effective as, as classroom learning. You see pretty similar low percentages in individual countries at individual colleges and universities. Why is there still, why is there still such skepticism uh, about the quality of online education? And in your mind, how do you get over that that hurdle. Well, you know, in 2013, Time magazine declared the, the year of the MOOCs and announced that the MOOCs would really be the big solution to all our problems. And indeed, when you have this capacity, if, you know, if, if Harvard or Stanford or MIT together can reach 150,000 students all over the world, this is an exciting prospect. But we see some backlash from, again, from professors who are not used to, be, to, to, to the, see the traditional way of teaching uh, challenge. You know, there is a joke among young students today saying that, you know, the professor goes to, to sleep and overnight the students go online and by, by morning they know more than the professor. Um, and I think that uh, we, you know, we have to recognize that we are dealing with young people who have, are learning in a different way, the so-called e-generation, and it's a challenge to adapt your teaching and learning methods, again, to empower, to accept that you can make teaching and learning much more interactive than students can learn on their own, that they can learn from their peer. An exciting experience at MIT, for example, is the technology-enhanced active learning classroom, where, or so-called flipped classroom, where the professor doesn't teach anymore. The students learn the basic notions by themselves, and when they come to a session, they will work in group to solve problems, to demonstrate that they have understood uh, and are able to uh, deal with real life solutions. Right, and of course one of the powers of online education is this idea that it could be just in time. You, you, you get the skill as you need it. And, and Hugh, in terms, of, in terms of your work, do you see this idea where education is going to be lifelong? Um, you're going to need it in order to get these higher level skills to move up in the, in the job market. Do you think that can help boost demand um, for graduates who have not only a, a skill that they learned 20 years ago when they graduated from a university, but constantly are updating their skills. Do you, do, you, do you sense that this idea of lifelong education could shift the job market in a positive way? 
Jeff, if I could just respond very quickly to okay. Jamil. Um, Jamil, if those professors are that slow, they'll soon be replaced, as we might be, with holograms. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the things, and one of the fundamental problems with the lack of demand I was talking about is, of course, that technology is moving up the skill chain very, very quickly indeed. The MOOCs with holograms together could, re could cut the cost of faculty considerably uh, in universities. Um, and that's not too far in the future. It wasn't long ago that we didn't think we could Skype. Uh, now we take it as part of our normal everyday life. So um, the problem is, of course, that those, um, that technology is moving up all the skill chains. It's not only in, at the potentially in education. And that's reducing the demand for skilled labor, graduate labor. And that's part of the story, and that's part of the problem. Now, there are solutions to this, but we need to think out of the box. This is a major crisis. Um, this is not something, there are always going to be skills mismatches under capitalism. That's always going to be the case because of the changes in technology, the changes in the nature of work. But we do have a major crisis. We need to confront that. Um, and my view is that we need to provide young people with a basic income, so, which is guaranteed so that they have the freedom to experiment and to innovate. And alongside that, Jeff's alluding to, I think, the idea of having some kind of lifelong learning account so that you can get some support for um, enhancing and developing your skills as you move through forms of um, your own innovation, ways you might use technology differently to develop that. I think that's the nature of the future. If we just think about yeah, we're going to get graduates' jobs. In some countries, that's the case, where there is um, demand for them. I mean, in the developed world, Germany, perhaps in some areas, would be an example, not all. But in many countries, that's not going to be the case. And we need to start thinking much more creatively about how we're going to address this fundamental problem. So are you suggesting that at WISE, in 10 years, we're going to have holograms up here, and we're not going to be here? Hell, it'll be a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, but what, so in your mind then, what jobs are safe? Um, okay, so um, there's a professor of economics and education at Harvard called uh, Richard Manane, Dick Manane. And I was having a seminar debate with him a few weeks back. And he has written a, a paper, which you can download as I'm speaking, called Dancing with Robots, which is a wonderful title. And his question is, what is it that robots can't do that human beings can do? And what are the skills that are required for human beings under those circumstances? So it's an innovative, interesting, and challenging paper. But um, there's a kind of sting in the tail, as I pointed out to him when we had this debate at Harvard. Um, the sting in the tail is that when he, look, he identifies what he calls foundational skills. These are the skills that you need, and they're very much like Monica's soft skills that robots can't do, or right now can't do. So then what he does is he charts the demand for these skills over time, and he starts in 1990, and you see there's a very rapid increase in demand for those skills, the soft skills, you may call them. But after that, they flatline. So again, we've got a problem. The problem is if we have more and more of these people being able to do these non-robot soft skills, then what kind of jobs are they going to have? So we're back to that kind of question again as to how we're going to deal with that particular issue. And of course, why this matters, Monica, is that this idea that we need people working on the young end of, this, uh, of the spectrum because increasingly around the world, we have more people who are going to be living in retirement and somebody needs to be supporting them. You call this the, the double squeeze. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing um, in terms of the demand on the young person side and as that, and what happens on the, on the other end of the spectrum in terms of retirement? Yes, this is one of the four macro, macro tendencies, macro trends that we see in Manpower Group. One is, let, let me start from the beginning. One is we are facing more sophisticated clients because we have technology, we have information, we have internet, we can compare, we can decide, we can give an opinion. On the other hand, we have more uh, individual choices because of the same thing. We have multiple choices in our lives. And uh, the third trend is technological revolutions. And the, the fourth trend is this demographic 
uh, mismatch. We have this double squeeze. In, in many countries, we have a demographic bonus, lots of young people, but they are not prepared to the global work. And on the other hand, we have countries with older people, Japan, Italy, Germany, that they, are, they have not enough young talent to fill the positions that the retirement are living alone. So we need to create a kind of balance. We need to, pre on one hand, some countries need to prepare the population uh, and they have a gap in the skills that they are preparing. And on the other hand, we have this lack of young people to fill uh, the positions that, that, the, that the older people is living. So many of you outlined some of the issues, some of the problems we're facing, and some solutions. And of course, the question really is, who's going to pay for all of this? Right? So in parts of the world, we have a developing higher education system. In other parts of the world, we have a very mature system that needs to be essentially renovated and changed. Um, and according to the uh, WISE um, poll, again, that was taken by uh, uh, Gallup, 70% uh, said that their country does not invest enough in higher education already, right? So I want to talk to all four of you about this issue, right? So who is going to be responsible, whether you're in a developing country in terms of higher education or you're at this mature level where we're already seeing large cutbacks, uh, especially by governments, who's going to be paying for this? Is it employers? Is it students? Is it governments? Or is there some other magical stream of revenue we're not seeing? Let me start with you, Jamil. Well, wouldn't we all want to be born in Qatar or in Switzerland or in Norway? We wouldn't have to worry about this issue. But for most countries, it is a serious issue, even for rich countries. If you look at the impact of the financial crisis in the US, for example, since 2008, we see a decline in real terms in public funding for higher education in 48 out of the 50 states. And this is a pattern that we see all over the states. So the, the various sources of funding that you mentioned, uh, uh, Jeff, I would say it's all of the above. I mean, the, the governments have to remember that investment in people is the best investment. In fact, when the, prime minister, the new prime minister of Norway, who is a lady whose name escapes me now, but when she took over la uh, last year, she, in her first speech, she said, you know, oil for Norway, that's the past. Our future is knowledge, and we need to invest in knowledge. And I think we have, it, it applies to all countries in the world. So governments cannot retreat from their responsibility. But if money is not sufficient, then employers have to step in, and families, insofar as they can afford it. Of course, with proper student aid mechanisms to protect students from low-income families. So well, is, it, is it all great here in, uh, in Qatar when, when you have so much, uh, uh, when you have so much support from the, from the government for higher education? Of course, and I'm a very optimistic uh, person. Everything has been happening top down uh, because uh, you need a political determination, especially when it comes to education. But being also very realistic and looking at the economic and demographic changes that's, that uh, factors that will um, impact education on the long run, no, I think that uh, it is time for us to engage uh, the employer, definitely. We need to engage the employer. The private sector needs to have a say in education without uh, affecting governance at some point, yeah. And Hugh, I mean, other countries have had golden eras in, in higher education. We've seen it in Great Britain, we've seen it in the United States, um, where there was a lot of government support, and now there's a lot less government support, particularly as Jamil mentioned in the US. Um, what about those countries where there have been incredible retreats in the last uh, decade or so uh, from public support for higher education? Will we see the public support come back in those countries, or, or are we going to see a new financing system in your mind? Uh, again, this is one of those really, really difficult questions um, that we as educators are having to confront. And it's a really difficult question because, for example, in the UK, the um, projections of graduate earnings were massively over-optimistic when they introduced a system whereby graduates would pay 9,000 English pounds um, per year, 
and the government retreated dramatically in terms of the funding of higher education. Now they reckon around 48% of graduates will never pay back their loans because they're just not earning enough, which is very consistent with the data I gave you earlier. So there's a problem with trying to, and in fact the system that, with the government having to pay back those loans itself, having guaranteed them, there's no difference effectively financially in the two systems where the government paid most of the money in the first place and then gave them these students the loans or supported the loans but asked the students to pay them back. So there's a huge problem there in terms of um, who's actually paying, as a matter of fact, um, for, the, for this university education. When it comes to employers, I have a worry. Um, on the one hand, it's quite clear that employers should be more involved because they often complain from the touch lines. And they complain from the touch lines about skills gaps because they've, they've changed themselves. In days gone past, employers used to train graduates. They used to actually put a lot of work into them. Now they want plug in and play because the competitive pressures are so great. Not always the case, but often the case. So my worry is that employers might come along and say, we want this particular kind of education for this particular group of people. But that education may be quite limited. Not always, but quite often it's quite limited. It's very specific. And that then comes back to your point, Jeff, about, well, what are universities for? Um, do we want wider sense of um, skills, character development, um, understanding and knowledge, or do we something, need something much more narrow? So again, there are difficulties with all three of these potential funders of education. But Monica, one of the reasons why employers don't want to put too much into training is because they don't want to train somebody else's employee down the road. And you know, people are not staying in jobs or occupations for 30 plus years anymore. They might stay, especially today's young people might stay in a job for two or three years. Um, and so if you invest a lot in that employee, uh, they're going to move on to either competitor or in whole new industries, right? So that's what, that's what I'm hearing employers say. What do you, what do you hear from the, the folks you're working with? I, I think that the challenge is um, to retain the talent. As we are facing a scarcity of talent, we need to be like marketers to retain the talent that we have trained. Um, I think that uh, companies need to train people or they will not have employees because there is not the ideal employee that is just graduated from the university. All the companies are investing in talent. We need to invest more in retaining the talent. Um, the other thing that I believe is that training is a responsibility of everybody. Everybody is paying, government, uh, companies, families, schools, but the, the other element that is very important to remark from my point of view is that individuals need to pay, need to pay in time for training themselves without waiting someone else to do that. And in some countries we see that young people are not taking that responsibility of training themselves on the job or training themselves in new uh, things that can be useful in the future. Jamil, I want to uh, move back to you for a second because I want to talk about why this matters. And you've done some work um, uh, that we're showing on this slide right now about uh, the evolution of enrollment by income quintile. And what we're seeing here, obviously, is that there is now a, a big disparity um, in terms of enrollment by income uh, uh, quintile. There's incredible haves and have-nots now in higher education. Can you talk a little bit about why this has been uh, happening and, and what are the trends more so for the future? Indeed, this issue of equity in higher education is, is of concern because we assumed for a long time that just by increasing enrollment we would take care of the problem. But when in countries where you have data, and here I'm showing you data from Chile, for example, we see that even though enrollment has increased overall, even though enrollment has increased even for the poorest quintiles, the gap between the poorest and the richest has also increased. 
So government cannot just sit back and think that by we're providing more opportunities, it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And you have some work specifically around uh, the University of Sao Paulo and, and some other... Uh, yeah, so the, the assumption you may have read in the papers that uh, see, Chile is the only country in Latin America that charges tuition fees. And a few years ago, the students rebelled in the streets and asked for free higher education. In fact, the new government, uh, as one of its main items on the campaign platform, pledged to offer free higher education. But I think there is a fallacy there. We assume that helping poor students is just by removing tuition fees. Uh, but it's not the case. I can, if you see, we have data on Argentina on the left where higher education is free, Brazil, where public universities are free, and then we have Chile on the right, where there were tuition fees. And the paradox is that Chile, despite the tuition fees, is more equal than countries where you charge fees. Why is that? And if we can see this, the next slide is that, um, see, if we take the example of University of Sao Paulo, which is the most prestigious university in Brazil, it's a public university and they don't charge fees, but access is very competitive. So what do we see? On the left, we have the statistics about candidates to the entrance examination. We have 14% of them come from private high school, 86 from public high school. But who is better prepared? who gets into the university 70% from the private schools. So their parents paid for them to get a better education in private high schools, and then they will benefit from free high education. So in that kind of systems, and we see that in many countries in the world, we have the poor subsidizing the rich. And it starts well before they start at the university. You have some maps here that you want to show us, I know. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I think it's very important when we think about equity to remember, remind ourselves that it's not only about money, but it's about what happened before. And I hope that the, these three, the three maps I'm going to show you can illustrate that in a vivid way. Again, we are in Chile, Santiago de Chile, the capital city. And the red dots show you the, where the students have gone to high school secondary education. And you can see first in this University of Santiago de Chile, which is an average university, public university, so it's not very expensive. And you can see that students come from all over the city. But then if we move to the next slide, we will see the top public university. And you can see already that there is more concentration on the top right hand side, where the richest people live. And if we move to the next one, we'll see the top private university in the country. And we see very vividly the concentration. So even when you have a meritocratic system of access, it is always biased because of what happened before. In fact, when we think about equity in higher education, we have to remember that it is determined to a large extent but by what happened or didn't happen before. A friend of mine, Bruce Chapman, some of you may know him, he was the father of the uh, income contingent loan system in Australia, uh, used to say, perhaps jokingly, but there is a lot of truth in that, he said that you know, to determine your future, the best thing, the, more, the most important decision that you have to make is to choose your parents well. <laughs> Why is that? Because where we grew up, the family in which we grew up, will determine our future to a large extent. If we get a lot of intellectual, emotional, and if, uh, support, we will have better chances than kids who don't. And this picture, these are actual pictures of the brains of two, three-year-old kids in the US. On the left side, one who grows up in a normal family gets a lot of stimulation. On the right side, a child that has been neglected. And that will, that will impact even the physical development of her or his brain. And that gets replicated afterwards when we go to primary, secondary education. So when we think about equity, it's not only about money. It's about getting the right intellectual support and stimulation, getting motivation, getting all the information that is needed. There are examples from the country where Hugh lives in the UK, where many bright students who would qualify for the top schools 
will select themselves out of these schools and go to lesser schools because their parents are from working class families and they have been raised thinking high education is for the rich. It's even very it's similar to what them. Michelle Obama was talking about today, even among women who are choosing not to take, not to go to challenging schools because of their uh, of their parents. And I mean, part of the problem here is it seems like we have a handoff problem, right? We, we start, uh, you know, with parents handing off a problem to schools, to primary schools, primary schools handing it off to secondary schools, secondary schools handing it off to universities, universities eventually handing it off to uh, employers, employers handing it off to society, right? Nobody wants to deal with the, with the actual uh, issues here. We're gonna be moving into questions from the audience in, in just one minute, but there's a, an underlying tension here um, that we haven't quite addressed, and that is, what is the purpose of a university education? Um, is it to train somebody for a job, uh, or is it to broadly educate somebody who then can take those broad skills and figure out how to navigate life, um, figure out what the jobs are, and figure out how to do them? I mean, how much hand-holding does the university have to do to train somebody for a job? Or is their, is their job, is the job of the university to broadly educate somebody and to give them those, those um, natural skills? I, I wanna kind of get just brief perspectives from each of you on that, on that question. What is the purpose of a university education? To develop three-dimensional human beings, basically. To uh, qualify graduates for academia and the professional field to work on humanities and the set of skills, skills create combined degrees to uh, meet the market needs and anticipate the future as well. I think university American. should focus on the person as a person in the three dimensions, creating global citizens, values, responsibility, and people that will be able to create value and economic growth for their countries. Hugh. I was at Columbia not long ago giving a seminar and they told me there that all first year students at Columbia have to take philosophy. And I thought that was really important and they run through the kind of great philosophers right from Plato right through. And when you ask yourself the questions, the fundamental questions about living, um, the meaning of life if you will, um, then to go to those philosophers and to take through that, through up to the present day, is a kind of interesting and challenging way of doing it. And they all do it. Scientists, engineers, medics, everyone does it. Uh, and they are totally committed to that as a particular way of thinking about this rounded personality that they're seeking. And universities clearly ought to be doing that. Um, as we enter the, and as we continue in the 21st century, these questions are going to become much more important um, because people, individuals, are going to be thrown much more onto their own resources um, without uh, so much state help and without support from employers uh, because many of those jobs are going to be intermittent. So I think that that's what a university should be focusing on. Doesn't mean it doesn't do. Um, Vocational stuff, we've always had med schools, lawyers' schools, law schools, engineering schools. But for the majority, um, that's not the case. But Jamil, also at the same time, as the cost of higher education goes up around the world, parents, students, governments, employers say, what are we paying for, right? We want something tangible at the end that can have a return on that investment in human capital. I want to just give the example of a, a new school that I found very exciting and revolutionary. It's called All In College of Engineering. It's uh, just a little bit south of Boston, Massachusetts, in the US. And they are trying to, to prepare the engineer of the 21st century. And they described that person as someone who knows not only about the feasibility of building something, but also about the viability, who is, can be an entrepreneur, and most importantly, about the ethics linked to what they are preparing. They want to be responsible engineers who will contribute to improving the world, not making it worse. I'd like to hear from each of the panelists, what is the way forward? Because it's extremely challenging when I look at my own education and what I'm expecting my kids to have to go with in terms of being able to handle the financial costs and everything else, 
please, if we could suggest some ideas, what is the way forward from each of the panelists? That'd be wonderful. We've given some pretty depressing statistics here. What is, I have a, as I said yesterday, I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old at home. I want to know what their future is going to be in this world that's going to be very difficult to navigate. What can they do, but more so, what can countries do to help develop them? I would come back to this notion of empowering our children to believe that they can do a better job than we have done in a way, create a better world. And, and if you allow me just one minute to give a personal example, my youngest son actually is a university dropout. But after dropping out, he decided to set up his own company. And he said, my trick would be I will go to people's home and repair their computers. But he had no computer training, and I watched with a lot of anxiety what was going to go on. And, but you know, it, after month after month, it was, his business was growing, it was going well. And one day I asked him, but Karim, aren't you scared that you would get to a customer and you will not know what to do? And his answer you know, really shook many beliefs that I had because it, it shows the power of being empowered. He told me, but dad, how else do you want me to learn? Young people today know where to, you know, they dare. They dare do things that we never dared do. And they know where to find information and how to find it. And they have, if you have the critical, uh, the ability to, to know where to get information and identify the right information, I think that this notion of empowerment and, uh, is what will make it a better world. Um, my name is Louise and I run an organization called the Undergraduate Awards. Um, we're trying to identify the world's top students and um, next week we're going to bring 150 of them. And we're the world's largest academic awards program so we have a huge pool and thankfully um, affiliated with a lot of universities in this region as well. But next week we're actually asking them this question. Um, well, and the, the overall question is who should pay for my university education? And um, so the idea is that it's the students in the room. And, um, but one of the things that, so first of all, just to say that um, I'm excited to hear what my students are gonna be saying next week. And if anybody wants me to feedback their, their thoughts on the matter, um, please come to me and um, I'll, I'll send you on their, uh, the feedback. But also for the panel, um, one thing I'm not really hearing too much about is about um, research. To me, a university, um, it is definitely all about the three-dimensional and, and empowerment, but also there's a huge amount of research that, that is the future of humanity being produced in our universities. And that goes beyond jobs, and that goes beyond knowledge. This is usable, very, very breakthrough, medical, scientific, um, out of this world stuff that's coming from our universities, to me that's the huge value. And I wonder, one thing I'm not sure that the universities are doing a great job of is informing the, uh, the citizens of their countries about that value that they're bringing. And I just wonder if anyone has any more thoughts about that. Definitely research is, is the key word here, especially in higher education in Qatar. And, and as we are a part of um, uh, a new university in Education City, Hamad bin Khalifa University, which is a research uh, university. Our focus is on research because this is the way to inform the market. This is the way to connect socially, uh, engage uh, uh, the social fabrics of Qatar through research and through technology. Uh, and this is the way of connecting globally as well. So internally, through research and technology, by informing, changing policies, let's say. But globally, by research, puts you on the global uh, stage as well. So we're talking about benchmarking, we're talking about uh, applied research, we're talking about research that uh, would bring uh, and promote um, uh, local um, uh, citizens or local professors as well. So research is a huge and, and the key word here. But, but at the same time, this hybrid university that has done research and teaching has, is very expensive um, and very expensive to run and sometimes has a dual purpose that is at odds with each other. Can we continue to do, we should do both, but can single institutions do both? I think they can, I think they should and this is part of an answer to the question up there and I'll come to your question because I think it's also very important. And the reason for that is that you very often find that the top professors are also the best teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason for that is simply because they're passionate, they live their lives, their identities are caught up with their research. Um, and if they can also communicate it well, 
and typically they can, uh, not always. As we know, I was at the launch of a mathematics institute at my university, and the director said, um, how do you know an extrovert mathematician? Answer, he looks at your shoes, not his own. <laughs> Um, so there are difficulties for some, I know, but nevertheless, in my personal experience, the best professors in research terms are also the best to communicate, mm -hmm. and we see that from the MOOCs. Yes, number two over here. Hi, my name is Cheryl Stotland, and I run an organization called For Girls Sake, and it's focused on helping girls um, get educated in uh, more impoverished worlds. Um, my commentary uh, first would be that I think secondary schools have an equal responsibility to prepare our children um, for university and then universities following that. And I, my other comment, which will lead into my question is, I don't think we even know what half the jobs will be in the coming years. So how can universities uh, and higher education be prepared for what we don't even know exists yet? A great question, Monica. I mean, this is one of the reasons why these 21st century soft skills are so yeah. important, right? Because they're training people for any job, not a specific job. Precisely, the challenge of the university is prepare people for the future. And with all the technology and all the things that are happening very, very fast and is they more faster than ever, the things that you learn at the university could become obsolete in two years. And in 20 years will become obsolete in 73 year, days. So, soft skills, the skills for the 21st century are, are, from my point of view, the, the center of all the education that we should be given in the, in the schools. Yes, go ahead. And then the questions over here. Sure, and I'd like to add actually that what, what we could do in universities is offer combined degrees. So widen the set of skills of our graduates. And uh, the second point would be engage the previously marginalized sector of the society, women. So women is, is a huge drive that has not been tapped into, whether in higher education or in the job market. So I guess those two points I wanted to add. Probably the most important skill is to teach students how to navigate ambiguity because the future is going to be very ambiguous. And you were asking whose responsibility is it to teach these soft skills. You didn't mention parents up there. Soft skills, leadership, problem solving, this is something so basic. I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit more about that role of parents. Parents has the first responsibility of the educating, uh, educating child. But most of the parents are not prepared in those skills, but because they were not critical, or they don't have education, or they live in poverty. So uh, parents, yes, has the responsibility, but it's not enough. We, we need to develop these uh, skills since the elementary school, since kindergarten. University is not enough. It's not a training of two year, days or six months. We need to, to develop it in a career path, in the life path. I'm Danish from India, uh, and I'm part of a Buruj Education Research Organization. One of the challenges, and having kind of worked in the past in the corporate life, uh, the job seeking and the job seekers, employee-employer uh, kind of relationship, and the skills gap that we're talking about. Uh, my question is, do we need a paradigm shift in the way pre-primary, primary, and secondary education is happening? Instead of targeting them to be uh, job seekers, can we program them to become job creators, eventually covering the skills that we are talking about? It's what we are missing at the moment. Uh, is that the open question I have? Uh, is that the solution we look at? To be, to be a job creator does require risk. It does require confidence. It requires motivation and initiative. And capital in some cases. And capital. Um, and that's why I was talking about the idea of a basic income which was guaranteed. Um, because that gives people a basis for taking risks. If they're in poverty, they can take risks because they've got the next de meal to deal with. So we need some system for doing that. And when you look at actually um, the situation in the developed world, the numbers of people who are now so-called self-employed is increasing dramatically. It's a very, very significant part of modern economies. But are these people creating jobs? Well, a few perhaps, but many are taxi drivers, uh, and not earning that much because there's so many of them now. Um, so we need to think about, I think you've gone on to something very important, but we need to think through what the underpinning for that 
what support mechanisms there'd be to enable that to happen. And here, as we were talking earlier, what, what's worrisome is that if you place more of the cost of education on the backs of students, they're less likely to take those risks after they graduate because they're gonna need some sort of money to pay back their loans. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is talk of an entrepreneurial state and that comes from the, idea, the view, um, the well-established view actually, that much of the innovation in the world has actually come from the state. This is particularly true of America, which has got a terrific, and has had for years, a terrific industrial policy. Never called it that, of course, because that's not what markets are meant to do, um, but has done it through the military. And then that's been capitalized on with the phones and you've now got on your, in your pockets and so on and so forth. So we need to think of the entrepreneurial state as also providing the support for potential entrepreneurs. And that means that we probably have to have states funding higher education. Because with the debt levels now rising for students, the risk is to take a safe job, a lower paying job, to pay off the debt. Yes, question over here, number one. My name is uh, Chris Mayaki of the Nigerian National Universities Commission. The higher education landscape in Nigeria, as is, as is uh, in the rest of Africa, is fast expanding, as you know. What would you advise uh, African higher education on the risk associated with uh, preponderance, the proliferation of online distance education and MOOCs and all these uh, open uh, e-learning resources? Uh, how would we mitigate the, the, the dangers you know, involved in content? You know, because we're really inundated by this uh, uh, online provision. And there's a danger that content, we're worried about the content. We're worried about uh, our money's worth and the danger, you know, for unsuspecting uh, intending uh, higher education providers. Thank you. A few years back, I was doing some work in Bolivia. And when I walked into the, the offices of the Minister of Higher Education, he was, I found him, he was very agitated and angry. He said, there is this university from Spain called the Open University of Catalonia. They want to offer a PhD online. Surely I should ban that. And I explained to him, you know, this is a very prestigious university in Spain that has a lot of experience in online learning. I think we have to be very careful. And uh, you're right, there is a proliferation of, of uh, fraudulent uh, programs, but there are also now very good programs. And it's, uh, if you look at who has launched the MOOCs, it's, these are really big names in the, in, in the business. Uh, Georgia Tech today, one of the top uh, uh, engineering uh, university in the US offers an online MOOC for engineering. So we have to apply the same quality assurance standards to these uh, online courses. And also it's not one or the other. Increasingly we will see that we will have blend le blended learning and, and traditional university is relying increasingly on some online courses or giving both options. So it, it, you have to apply the same rigorous quality assurance uh, criteria and principles, but at the same time have an open mind because this can help learning in a more innovative way at a, more, at a much more cost-effective um, in a cost-effective manner. My name is Sarah De Freitas. I'm at Murdoch University in Australia. I set up the Serious Games Institute in the UK um, a, f a few years ago and now we have branches in, in four continents and we're in discussion about developing one in a, a fifth continent in Australia. So I was really quite interested in the discussion really around interactivity in learning and how we can actually shape the future of learning in terms of in making more engaging learning for our students. Um, working in a university, I realise how unengaged many of the students are, particularly with the lecture format. And I think, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about flipped classroom, and I think that there's a, you know, I think the students themselves are flipping the classroom. And I think also, you know, to remember that a lot of these kids are growing up with modern technologies, mobile technologies, smartphones, etc. You know, I'm just interested in the panel's views on, on what they think the role of interactivity in terms of gamification and, and games might be. Uh, pushing the boundary back a little bit further from online learning, which I think now has become quite widespread, and, and as we were saying about MOOCs, you know, the next horizon for me is really around the next sort of technologies and innovations. So for me, that's sort of in the gamified sort of area, mobile learning, that sort of area. 
I'm interested in the views of, of the panel on that, and in particular the impact in, in, in terms of the global village that we have now, where we can all talk to each other and communicate with each other so much and so easily. And this is unfortunately going to be our last question. So anybody want to take the answer to that? Okay. Just a few words. I mean, those of you who are parents will know the difference between the lack of excitement of your children when they come back from their high school or sometimes primary school and the hours that they can spend on the internet playing these interactive video games. And, and the reason is, and in fact neuroscience explains now, so that we learn much better when it's fun, when we are motivated, when there is passion. And interactive learning, learning from your peers, learning through stimulation, learning through games can be much more effective. And I think we have just begun to to think about that, and there is a lot of power to be that can so, be tapped. Jamil, why do we do that so much at the, you know, I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and we do that so much at the primary level and at the preschool level, but at some point we switch that. We don't make learning play-based and fun. At some point we make it it's drudgery for many people. Why, why, why do we have that switch if we know so well that it does work and it engages students? Because we are stuck with tradition and, and, to, and the idea that learning should not be fun, which is really ridiculous, on the, on the opposite. Also, the, the false notion that uh, making a mistake is bad, right. you know. And uh, now we, we, we can see that you can learn much more from, by making mistakes through errors and learning from these errors than in the traditional fashion where the, oh, we, I have to have the right answer, otherwise it's, it's not really. Uh, Monica, one, uh, one quick thought and Hugh, one quick thought and then we're gonna wrap yeah, up. Yeah, 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 and, and I want to say that the same thing is happening at the job place. That's why people is moving faster because it's not fun. You, you need, you respect the tradition of a boss, not a leader, that making a mistake is the worst thing in life, uh, that they don't, learn from their peers, we need to, to apply the same model in companies, in the companies. Hugh, and this will be the last uh, thought. One of the reasons why that switch might be is that the further you go up the education ladder, particularly at the postgraduate level, there are huge risks in taking postgraduate courses. And the way in which that can be mitigated is by establishing a relationship with your tutor, your professor, whomsoever, of trust. And the trust becomes absolutely crucial to this. And I reckon that around 95% of what I do as a PhD supervisor, and I supervise a lot, is to do with confidence. Building and developing people's confidence. Confidence is everything in education. It's a great thought to end on. Please join me in thanking the panel for this great discussion today. Thank you.